professional author and researcher on pornography and its addiction. Welcome to the show, Gary. Hey, how you doing? We're doing fantastic. It's so great to have you on the show. You know, in this modern day where internet and television and streaming from cell phones is rampant, sex and pornography have become so intertwined. And I thought it was so important to have you on the show to talk about this subject that a lot of people aren't talking about, but yet we need to. Well, good. I'm willing to talk about it. What do you think is the biggest problem with internet porn and how does it affect people? The biggest problem is that it's probably altering uh, sexual taste, perhaps. Uh, It's sometimes reducing, and maybe this is equal or more, it's reducing the attraction between partners. It's uh, interfering perhaps even with bonds, pair bonding. Uh, And interesting enough, not only studies, but uh, many guys who have quit, hundreds of thousands, have found that it's also affecting them in ways they didn't expect, such as when they quit, they could think better, their concentration problems went away, they had more motivation, their social anxiety went away, confidence increased, even depression went away, and emotional numbness went away. So it's, it's a really big question that probably has to be broken down into its single part. To address them, I think. As you're talking, I'm reminded of interviews that I've seen with world-renowned athletes, specifically boxers, and how they talk about not having sex or masturbating before a match. That's a different question than what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about masturbation. I'm not talking about ejaculation. I'm not talking about orgasm. I'm talking about a new stimulus, a supernormal stimulus that never existed before 2006. And when I say 2006, I mean, the invention of YouTube and then tube sites allowed streaming videos of short clips. And that's when many of the older guys in their 40s and 50s started to find develop sexual problems. They developed ED, even though they've been using porn for 30 years. So it's this isn't about sex. It's not about orgasm. It's about a different audiovisual stimuli where we can control our arousal simply by clicking our mouth. 2006. So we date it back to 2006. Yeah, I date it back to 2006 as a big leap. Because, of course, you know, uh, high speed internet hasn't been around that long. So guys describe taking about four minutes to download a single picture. A picture is different from a video. If you're an adolescent, for example, and you get a picture of a naked lady, all you can think about is feeling up her boobs. If you're an adolescent, 13 year old, and you get a streaming hardcore video of gang rapes, then you can think you're seeing real people have real sex and that's what you think may be real, whether it's ejaculating on women's faces or anal penetration or all these strange things. So the leap was when we had videos. Now we then had a second leap when smartphones came around and the speeds of the internet have increased every year. So now they can just stream high definition videos like crazy. So yeah, there's been a big change uh, and the technology is what's different. I know one thing about you is that you do a lot of research on the impact of pornography and right now you're really looking at the impact it has on the teenage brain. I'd love to hear some of the science and research that you've been finding. So the first thing to know is that they've been doing a lot of research on the adolescent brain over the last 10 to 20 years, both in animals and now with uh, brain scans in humans. And what they used to think was there was this old model that an adolescent brain is just like an adult and they're just not mature enough. But what they found is the adolescent brain is completely different from a child's brain and an adult brain. And adolescence really starts around age 11 and continues until about age 25 in terms of brain changes. And two of the big things that they found that are different is first, there's an imbalance of power between the thrill seeking parts of the brain, the reward circuit, the primitive brain, and the more evolved part of the brain, which is our frontal cortex. So what that does is it makes the teen seek out novelty, seek out thrilling things to seek out anything that'll get its dopamine and its neurochemicals flying. And it gets such a bigger buzz 
from novelty and sex and anything exciting. So it's really controlled by this primitive part of the brain and it doesn't have the brakes to put on that seeking. So it loves things like clicking on, you know, internet pornography or Facebook or other things. That's one of the changes. The second major change is that there's a, an explosion of new nerve connections. And then over the next several years until about age 23, those nerve connections are pruned down about a hundred billion of them until you're sort of set with your behaviors and the way you deal with life. So you're really constructing how you deal with the environment. And all this in terms of evolution, why did evolution have an overactive reward circuit seeking pleasure and an underactive uh, higher brain? Well, evolutionarily, they wanted the animal to leave its tribe in the face of danger and go out and seek new mates and new territories in order to successfully reproduce. So the adolescent, the bottom line to this whole story is the adolescent is shaping its brain to the environment, the sexual environment, and it's especially susceptible to what the internet has to offer in terms of novelty and sexual reward. You're really reminding me of my interview with Dr. Daniel Siegel and how he was talking about teens and the amount of dopamine and pleasure seeking that they have. And that's why they seek novelty and how much it is a parent's job to help guide them to find novelty in healthy ways. But, you know, one of the things like you're talking about with streaming and Internet and whatnot, it's a lot harder for parents to really monitor that nowadays. Since we know that the job of the adolescent brain is to wire up to the environment, all mammals, so it can successfully reproduce and live. So what is an adolescent wiring up to? Well, it's wiring up to sitting in a chair, clicking from three-minute video to three-minute video, masturbating and ejaculating to whatever's on the screen, and doing that for three, four, eight years before they have a sexual encounter. So they're wiring up those nerve cells, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So they're wiring up sexual arousal in one part of the brain with all the cues associated with porn use in another part of the brain. And yet when they meet a real person, it doesn't match that reality. So in essence, they're training for the wrong sport. I love how you're breaking that down with the the nerve cells firing to match up with sexual arousal and how much that probably affects them later in life. And you have this book, Your Brain on Porn, which is a fantastic breakdown where you start to talk about how the brain's affected by porn. Why do you think people get addicted to porn in the first place? You know, one model of addiction is that you have pre-existing conditions like depression or OCD or anxiety. And you start using porn and then you use it compulsively. However, here's what's wrong with that general model is that you can only become addicted to cigarettes by smoking cigarettes. You can only become addicted to gambling by compulsively gambling. You can only become addicted to porn by compulsively using porn because what goes on, the first step in addiction is to rewire the brain. Uh, to rewire the brain with that model of nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So it's wiring in the act of smoking or gambling or using porn, and it's wiring the brain so it blasts the reward center so you get a much bigger buzz for that one particular thing you've been over-consuming. So that's the first step in addiction. So you're asking, how can it happen with internet porn? Well, it can happen because all addictions occur with the same first step, and that's raising dopamine in the reward center, whether it's meth, whether it's gambling, whether it's porn. So you can sit and click on video and video and video for hours on end while you're masturbating and raise the dopamine in your reward center and wire in those associations and start the addiction process. One of the things that I've been asked about is, is all porn bad? I I know some people that like to watch porn and they're a little bit more leisurely about it. uh, And they even watch it with their partner. 
And I've also known people who have been addicted. You know, one of my friends uh, had a really hard challenge with this to the point that he didn't want to go to class. Uh, it, he, he just wanted to stay at home and watch pornography. And then on the other spectrum, there's people that just completely you know, have a complete disdain for it and think that it should just not exist whatsoever. Is there a middle ground? Well, that's a good question. Is there good porn and bad porn? And that's really a red herring. Uh, just to let you know, I'm a far left liberal. I'm not religious and I don't want to ban porn. But in terms of good and bad porn, that doesn't exist. It's, the question is not what's on the screen. Certainly there's some stuff that I think is disgusting, like gang rape or bestiality. Most people can agree to that, but some people can't. So what you do is you end up in endless debates about what's good and bad, and no one will ever agree. Rather, we need to go back to the brain and the effects. So if you're sitting there, and I got nothing wrong with, with Playboy or anything like that, if you're a young man and you're 15, and we've had a guy do this, who masturbated to just nude pictures, another guy just masturbated to swimming suit pictures, he ended up with erectile dysfunction because he needed to click through 1,000 to 2,000 separate images to get up enough energy to just ejaculate with a limp penis. So he had wired his sexual arousal to clicking from picture to picture to picture to picture in rapid succession. Was that porn? No, but he wired his brain into it. So. It's not that something's good or bad. It's the results. It's the results. And what results do you want? Do you want to wire in your arousal to the screen or do you want to get more excited with a real person? That's the question you should really ask yourself. Mm. How does pornography affect sex then in relationships? Well, to, uh, in terms of sex, I've only seen the negative effects uh, on sex. Now, there are people who say, well, it can spice up your life and maybe you can learn something. I don't know. But if you need to watch a screen in order to get aroused, aroused to the level you used to be aroused with your partner, then maybe you're some, doing something wrong with your partner. I don't personally don't want to have to need a screen to be aroused. I'd rather connect with my wife or my, you know, my wife and get my arousal that way. I think you really made the beautiful point of connection and how important that is for tapping into a deeper sense of arousal rather than just these flashy images. It's just clicking from thing to thing. Is that what you want to become aroused to? And where does that stop? Once you, once you can no longer get aroused with your partner like you did in the old days, then you go to porn. Well, once you can't get aroused to the old porn, then you go to new porn and new porn. And you start escalating through genres and genres until you need something that you didn't even want to use. So we see this over and over. Men end up using genres because they become so desensitized and habituated to earlier genres that they need extreme stuff. I don't think that's where most people want to end up. It's interesting. One of the things that you're really talking about is how we wire our addictions. And this can apply to all sorts of things. Am I right? Well, yes. I mean, uh, we are constantly wiring ourselves up to things and unwiring all the time. If you take up juggling, uh, then they can look at a uh, brain scan and see that you're making more nerve connections in certain parts of your brain. So they can see these connections. And of course, you become better at juggling. So, yeah, we're constantly molding and shaping our brain. Uh, the common term is neuroplasticity. And a great book I suggest is uh, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. In fact, he has a chapter about sexuality in there that's uh, very, very good. I had this ex-boyfriend who watched porn and he tried to hide it from me. But whenever he had been watching porn and he came and we started to get sexual, I could always tell because he would touch me different. He would he would seem more disconnected. He wouldn't make as much eye contact. And he just seemed to be more off in his own world. And is is that because of how pornography is affecting the brain? And can it just affect the brain in short term usage? 
Well, that's a good question. Brain is short-term usage. So let's, I mean, I've seen some clips of pornography I didn't want to see and it affected me. And I'm a six-year-old that's seen a lot of stuff. So I think it can affect you and it certainly can affect an adolescent. But back to your question, we've seen many guys who've decided to take up the challenge of giving up pornography. They were not addicted. The reason they know they're not addicted is because they could easily stop and they didn't have withdrawal symptoms. And yet what they experienced was much more arousal during sex, being much more present, focusing on their partner. So they found just that occasional use, maybe once a week, just for one masturbation session, had altered their arousal template. So I would challenge anyone out there to completely take a 90 to 120 day fast and just see if they find uh, their partners more exciting and their sex better. One thing I'm curious about is if you are addicted to porn and you're in a relationship, these are two questions is how can you start to rewire that addiction and how can your partner help you? Yeah, well, the first thing to do is attempt to uh, obviously you try to stop the addiction and that can be quite challenging. And there, there's several forums, uh, that you can find on my site and you can click to where you can get support. And you really have to replace porn with other activities. You, ought, you have to just get away from the computer and do other things. Now, in terms of health, the, let's say, girlfriend or wife needs to understand a few things. First of all, if he's truly addicted, he's going to have withdrawal. And he's going to feel irritable, and he might take it out on you. Another thing is many guys experience a flat line. That's where once they quit porn about a week or two into it, they lose their libido, uh, often cannot get erection, just don't find sex very exciting. And that can last for weeks to even a few months, depending on how addicted they are. So that's something to be aware of. And you need to be understanding around that. Then there's sex. Very, very important for, for the couple to do bonding behaviors, kissing, touching, holding, looking into each other's eyes, retraining the porn user, ex-porn user, to get their jollies, their arousal, their reward from real interaction to replace the porn. So those are some of the suggestions. Have you done any research around, and in a moment, I'd love to hear the website as well for anybody that's interested, because I know a lot of people need that resource. But before I before we move on to that, I'm curious, have you found in adults who watch hardcore porn or and have an addiction to it, has there been any correlation between abuse and that addiction? You know, that's, that's a hard question. There is just one study, maybe from several years ago, and they suggested that there was some correlation with about 8 to 9% of the porn users, some abuse. But here's something about the questionnaires in many of these studies, is they don't often ask the right questions. For example, anal sex wouldn't be considered to be abuse. However, a study from a couple of months ago on 16 to 18 year olds in the UK found that the young people, there was a tremendous rise in anal sex and that most of the females were co coerced into doing it, that none of the females question enjoyed it. And most of the males didn't like it either, yet both felt compelled to do it. And of course, what was the reason? because they saw it on porn. So that wouldn't show up in one of these types of surveys, but both, cup, both people are engaging in sexual acts that were uncomfortable, painful, and yet that wouldn't be part of abuse. It would be normalized. So we really need better studies to look at some of these different layers of what occurred. All this research is really fascinating, and I would really like to, for anybody who's interested and wants to have this sort of discussion further, because, you know, in a 30, 45 minute dialogue here with Gary Wilson, myself and Kamala, it's just not going to be enough. Gary, what is the name of your website? Pretty easy. Yourbrainonporn.com. 
And uh, it's a free site, tons of material there and videos and links to other resources, whether it's forums or books or stuff. So uh, yeah, you can find everything there. You're providing a really valuable service with that because a lot of people are really scared to even open up about this subject. I've watched some specials like on MTV and different channels where uh, Dr. Drew, for example, or some other well-known therapist will work with somebody on porn addiction. And most of the time, anytime I've seen it, and if anyone else was around me, they tend to kind of feel uncomfortable. It's, it's not that we're watching the show, but it'll flash on or something or watch it for a little bit, but most people are just afraid to have this discussion. Yeah, well, that's the way it is with sex. You know, you think about <laughs> even parents having the birds and the bees discussion with their kids is tough. Now, now they have to have not only the birds and bees, but you know, bestiality and hardcore porn and gang rapes, and that's not something they had to do a few years ago. So it's even harder these days. I'm curious, in your research, have you found that men tend to watch porn more than women? Uh, women who watch porn, is there something, any kind of particular specificities about them? Yes, of course, men watch more porn, and that's just through all the studies that's verified, because we're far more visual. You know, think about it evolutionarily, in terms of mammals, the ma mammalian male brain is sort of designed to seek out novel sexual partners to impregnate a bunch of different females so that he can pass on his genes. I mean, that, that program, even though we're humans and we fall in love and we're pair bonding, that program is just sitting in our brains because, heck, a beautiful woman walks by and our head goes into whiplash to look at her. So that's the novelty. So yes, men are more likely to do it, but the females are getting stuck in this too, uh, looking at it. Often uh, the, the anecdotes are that the women look for more of a storyline where the men look for rapid, very quick videos, but there's no hard and fast rule about this, I don't think. I see that there's a lot of secrecy between partners around pornography. And I, I just even recently had a friend tell me that she felt really betrayed by her husband who she caught watching porn. And he said that, you know, he lied to her about it. And there seems to be this this big gap between partners sometime around the subject of pornography and maybe they never talk about it. What do you think are some important keys to help couples kind of bridge that gap of secrecy? Yeah, I don't know if I have much answer to that because guys lie about using porn. It's just the way it is. Now, some women are fine with it and they don't have any problem. So that's what they're going to have to figure out on their own. And, you know, I'm not a relationship counselor. I'm just a physiology teacher. So that one I'll leave up to the relationship expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, you know, that's definitely a discussion that we've been having with some of the people in our lives and on the blog and in various other places about porn. Is it okay? How do you and your partner deal with it? And, and it is, it's a discussion that's very open. I've heard so many different opinions and yes, you're right. In my, in my own empirical research, men watch porn more. It's interesting to hear from you kind of the different slants that men and women have. I, I want to go back to your website. We're about to wrap up, but I would love to hear your website in case anybody else wants to jump on that. Yeah, so the website is yourbrainonporn.com. Uh, we just put out a book called Your Brain on Porn, and you can get that there too if you just want a summary of the website and don't want to look around through it. You know, you asked a question and Kamala was telling me this is a question that we should probably address before we jump off the call. And it's so you asked, how can partners talk about this? And you said you would leave leave it to the professionals. And really for us, it's it varies so much from couple to couple and person to person. And people have to make up their own mind in the relationship, how that's going to function for them. What I've found is that if couples can just openly begin to have the dialogue and 
Talk about, you know, if it's the man who likes watching it, tell your partner what kind of stuff you like watching and the wife ask questions and it might be incredibly uncomfortable, but for all you know, he might have an addiction and that might be the beginning of a conversation that leads from not having to lie to getting completely off of it and improving your life. Or it could come to a conclusion where it's okay and it's not as big of a deal as you thought. It's really dependent upon the couple and it kind of goes back to the core essentials of communication and how do you talk about things. Yeah, there's a couple of myths here that are important for, let's say, the wife or anyone. And the first one is that they're watching porn because she's not good enough. The thing is, there's it's so attractive just to be able to click from video to video. He may love his wife. He may even like sex with his wife, so he'll like it a lot better if he quits. But the novelty of the Internet cannot never, it's so overwhelming that a female cannot compare to that. A second thing is you may ask him, oh, what are you watching? Are you watching this? Well, what he's watching now may have nothing to do with his true sexual taste where they were before he started watching porn seven years ago. He may be in a place where he's escalated to weird stuff, but it's not really him. So he really needs to unplug and find out what his true sexual nature is. So bottom line is she cannot compare to porn. So, you know, keep that in mind. And the second one is what he's watching now may have nothing to do with who he really is. Mm. Wow, that's powerful. One thing you recommended was doing a porn fast or abstaining from porn. Do you want to say more about that or how how long you think someone would need to abstain to actually see results? Well, here's the funny thing. It's called rebooting, and it, and it came up probably on the Internet about eight or nine years ago with guys who were having sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, inability to orgasm, and they quit. And then their ED was cured and their anorgasmia was cured. And so that's why most guys actually quit. They hit the wall of sexual dysfunction. And the older guys took only about eight weeks to recover and they were back in the saddle. What we're seeing now is the younger guys who are about 23, 24, it can take them six months, a year, two years to get their erectile functioning back to normal. So the fast for some of these guys is very long. So I can't give you a time frame. but if someone doesn't have sexual dysfunction and doesn't have an addiction, if they give it 90 days, I think they'll be able to see how porn has affected them. Well, there you have it. Gary, you've made two excellent points that there is a myth around porn and what it means about the relationship and that people's porn interests can change and quickly escalate as well. So there is a, you know, people do need to be careful and just keep tabs on what's happening in their lives. And again, it comes back to that communication and talking with your partner. The other thing that I found the porn fast mm -hmm. and how that impacted people's sexual, uh, I don't know, their libido and the, the sexual dysfunctions. I thought that was really interesting how something that could be considered medical and, you know, a lot of times we're told, men are oftentimes told, if you want to last longer, if you want to be more sexually potent, you need to masturbate, you need to learn how to last longer. And some people use porn for that purpose, but what it's actually doing is it's wearing that part of your, uh, it's wearing you down. Yeah, and what happens is you wire up your sexual response to clicking from scene to scene. And then when you get with a real partner, you can't sit and click and change it from person to person, can you? So when sex doesn't match what you've been training for, what happens is your dopamine drops and dopamine is what uh, powers erections. And so your penis drops and you can't get an erection. So uh, yeah, it can really affect sexuality and that's what we're seeing and that's why guys are quitting. Well, there you have it, everybody. Gary Wilson, thank you for coming on the show. We've really, really enjoyed having you on here. It, feel free to go on to Amazon, check out Gary Wilson, or just Google him. He's got a TED Talk uh, and some great resources as well if you want to go to his website. Thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure. 
You've been listening to the Thriving Launch Podcast. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure to head over to thrivinglaunch.com. We'll see you there. Be sure to tune into our 